from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. It is my enormous pleasure to give you Matthew Desmond. Oh, hey. Hi. Hi. How are you? Oh, my goodness. It's so good to be here. Oh, Carlos. I've never met Carlos, but I feel like I've, you know, he's been in my life for the last year, and I remember reading your review. I remember the exact place I was when I read it. I read it on my phone. It was at a, a faculty thing, and my editor was sitting right next to me, and it came in, and we were just looking at it, and we were amazed. And, you know, uh, book critics have an incredibly hard and, and often thankless job, but, you know, for kind of authors like me who have, like, written other books, but they've been for an academic audience that are trying to break out to a more general audience, you know, and, and you know, a, a critic that really does her job or his job right is really important. So thank you so much, Carlos, not only for pushing this book, but for, you know, your amazing work at The Post. Um, and uh, it's just good to be with all of you today. I donated. I got the sticker. If you donate, you get a sticker. You didn't mention that. You get a sticker. So I've got one. Do it. Um, so we should, we should just get into it. So uh, we live in a weird country. We're the richest democracy with the worst poverty. That's who we are. And there's no other advanced industrial society that has the kind of poverty that we do or the depths of poverty that we have. And that's always troubled me. And I know it's troubled a lot of you. And I wanted to understand the role that housing plays in that story. And so I thought that looking at eviction, looking at families forcibly physically removed from their homes was a decent way of going about that. So I started those, this work the old-fashioned way. I moved into a trailer park on the far south side of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, Milwaukee's a city in America. It's in the middle of the country. Um, it's our 30th most popular city. Anyone from Milwaukee? Any Milwaukee, Milwaukee in the house over here? Ah, oh, love you guys. Can't make stuff up now, though. Um, <laughs> but, so I moved into a trailer park on the south side of the city, and I lived there for about five months. And then I moved into a rooming house on, on the north side of the city. That's Milwaukee's inner city. And I lived there for about 10 months. And from those neighborhoods, I followed families getting evicted. And I went everywhere with those families. I went to eviction court with them, followed them into shelters and abandoned homes. I watched their kids. I slept on their floor. I ate off their table. I went to work with them, uh, church, AA meetings with them, uh, several funerals, and was even there for a birth. Like there for a birth? Carlos, have you been to a birth? Yeah, I know, right? I know, yeah. <laughs> it's intense. It's intense. So I try, to, I try to get to know these families as much as I could. But I knew that to really understand how the low-income housing market works, I needed to get it just as tight with the landlords doing the evicting as I did with the families getting evicted. And so I did. And so I went to eviction court with landlords, too, and I helped them pass out eviction notices and collect rents. I saw them buy and sell properties. I understand why you would buy property in some of the poorest neighborhoods in the city. I understand a little bit more of what makes landlords tick and what ticks them off. And I try to write a book about this incredibly complicated and fraught but central relationship when it comes to understanding inequality in America today, that between landlords and tenants. So I was going about this work, and there are these questions that kept springing to mind, like how often does eviction happen? Who gets evicted? What are the long-term consequences of getting tossed from your home? And I went looking for some studies or at least some data that would allow me to address those questions. And I just came up empty. And so I said, OK, I, need to, I needed to do some things to collect the data myself. And one thing that we did, we designed a survey called the Milwaukee Area Renter Study. We talked to about 1,100 people all over the city of Milwaukee. And we sent interviewers into some of the most distressed neighborhoods in the city, those, those red dots, and some of the most affluent neighborhoods in the city, those those blue dots. I had an interviewer mugged, uh, one was bitten by a dog. It's actually the same guy, actually. Um, <laughs> Steve. <laughs> Steve needs to work on a situational awareness. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we worked really hard for these data. We got an 84% response rate, which in Nerdland is like really good. And we asked families like 250 questions about their kids and their housing and their health and their experience with eviction. I didn't stop there. We analyzed hundreds of thousands of eviction records that went through the civil court. We talked to 250 people right after they were evicted because we wanted to know, why do you get evicted but you don't, even though you owe your landlord the exact same amount? Analyzed the millions of 911 calls, hundreds of nuisance ordinances, and I try to put that big data into conversation with the smaller data, my notebooks, like the things that I was learning on the ground every day, just living alongside tenants and working alongside landlords. And Evicted in that spirit is really a book that starts on the ground and it ends on the ground. It follows eight families through the process of eviction. You know, you meet... Uh, Scott, Scott's in the book, you know, Scott was this kind of nurse 
um, that got hooked on painkillers and developed uh, an addiction to heroin, and you kind of see him wrestle with that addiction uh, throughout the book. Uh, Vanetta's uh, in the book, you know, Vanetta's a single mom trying to raise three young kids. She's working at Old Country Buffet, then her hours got cut, and she was so terrified of losing her home and maybe her kids to Child Protective Services that she committed an armed robbery to pay the rent. This is someone without any criminal record. And in that spirit, in the spirit of letting the folks that are on the front edge of this problem be our biggest teachers, you know, I want to share with you one person's story today, and that's Arlene's story. So Arlene had a 14-year-old son, Jory, and one day he was cutting up, throwing snowballs at passing cars, and he smacked this car. And it was like, Ert! and this man jumped out. So Jory and his cousin like hightailed it inside, and, they locked, and he locked the door. But the man followed him there, and he kicked the door in, kicked the door down. And thank God he left before anything else happened. But when Arlene's landlord found out about that, she decided to evict uh, Arlene and her boys for damaging property. So Arlene took her two sons, Jory and Jafaros, who was six, to the Salvation Army Homeless Shelter, which everyone in Milwaukee just calls the lodge. So you can tell your kids, like, we're staying at the lodge tonight, like it's a hotel. And from there, they were on the hunt for another place to live, and they found one on 19th Street. Uh, but there was often no water, and Jory had to bucket out what was in the toilet. Arlene told me, you know, it was 525 for a whole house, and it was quiet. You know, it was my favorite place. When we looked in that survey, and we asked what happens to families after they're evicted, one big thing we found is that they move into much worse housing than they lived in before. So if we want to know why some kids live with lead paint and exposed wires, no heat, no water, one reason is their families are forced to accept those kind of conditions in the harried aftermath of an eviction. So the city eventually found Arlene's favorite place unfit for human habitation. They boarded up the windows and the doors, and Arlene and her boys were on the hunt for another place to live. And she told Jory, like, we take whatever we could get, which is what moving looks like at the very bottom, just like taking what you could get. And what Arlene could get was this drab apartment complex on Atkinson Avenue. But she soon feared for her boys because she learned it was like a haven for drug dealers. In fact, the whole block was drug-soaked and hot. And she, she feared for Jory because he was goofy and had this beautiful smile and would talk to anyone. So in Arlene's case, why she moved, the fact that she was forced out of this place, was really important for why she ended up in such a bad neighborhood. And we thought, can we test that statistically? And we did. And we found that you can control for a lot of different things. And you still see the families who get evicted moving, moving from poor neighborhoods to even poorer ones. From dangerous neighborhoods to blocks with even higher levels of crime, eviction pushes families deeper into disadvantage. So Arlene moved out of Atkinson as fast as she could. She found this two-bedroom bottom unit duplex on 13th Street in Keefe. There's a big old hole in the living room window. Uh, the, there, there wasn't like a lock, so Arlene had to lock it with like, um, like a plank she slid into brackets. The carpet was just filthy and ground in. Uh, but she put on a good face. You know, she hung up curtains and she took a piece of clothing and she stuffed it in that hole in the window. So the rent for this kind of place, which is located in a really poor neighborhood in Milwaukee, which is our fourth poorest city, uh, was $550 a month, utilities not included, which consumed 88% of Arlene's uh, welfare check. And she knew that some months she would have to sell her food stamps to make rent, and her and the boys would try to get by on oodles and noodles. You know, when you're paying over 80% of your income on rent, there's no extra money for anything, like no money for clothes for jewelry or toys for Jafaris. So Jafaris had this like amazing ability to transform like a, like a bucket or a, a bottle or a dog leash, whatever he could get his hands on, into soldiers and tanks, you know, engaged in uh, warfare. So here's the situation. You know, Arlene is not alone in spending the vast majority of her income on housing. For about 100 years, there's been a consensus in America that we should spend about 30% of our income on housing costs. That gives us enough money to save, afford enough food, transportation. But that is so far off from the realities of most renting families today. So, uh, clicker, 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 clicker. I see the light going on. We, we have pros on it. Are we, uh, I can go on, it's okay, I'm not, I'm not like PowerPoint addicted, <laughs> but kind of. 
I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go on, and I'm gonna let the pros handle. So, um, so for the past 20 years, the percentage of poor renting families spending 30 percent of their income or less on housing, our widespread standard of affordability, has gone down and down and down. But the percentage of poor renting families spending at least half of their income on housing has gone up and up and up to the point that today, the majority of poor renting families are spending at least half of their income on housing costs. And about one in four of those families are spending over 70% of their income just on rent and utilities. So just imagine that, 70% of your income is just like gone at the beginning of the month if you want a roof over your head or hot water. Under those conditions, you don't need to make a huge mistake or have a big emergency wash over your life uh, to invite an eviction. Something as innocent as a snowball can do it. So for people like Arlene, eviction is much more the result of inevitability than personal irresponsibility. So how do we get to this place? So there's three ingredients to this recipe. One is the one we talk about a lot, which is for the past two decades, really for the past four, the incomes of Americans of modest means have been flat. In some areas of the country, they've fallen in real terms. But as families were watching their housing costs flatline, or their incomes flatline, their housing costs were soaring. Between 1995 and today, median rent in this country adjusting for inflation has increased by over 70%. Cost of fuels and utilities have increased by 52% uh, since 2000. And so you have this like gap between what low-income families are bringing in and what they have to pay for basic shelter needs. So then we might ask, and this is the third ingredient, where's public housing? Or housing assistance of any kind? And the answer is it's there, but it's only for the lucky major minority of families that receive it today. So only about 6% of poor families live in public housing today. That's that little blue part of the, the pie. 12% uh, uh, receive a rent-reducing voucher, which used to be called Section 8 vouchers. But the unlucky majority, the remaining 75% receive, um, what's the technical term? Nothing, nothing. <laughs> Not a Zippo from state, local, or federal governments. You know, I think that would be a situation that would be utterly unthinkable when it comes to meeting other basic needs. Imagine if we turned away three and four families who applied for food stamps. Like, I'm sorry, we don't have enough for you. You have to go hungry. But that's exactly how we treat low-income families searching for affordable shelter today. So Arlene gave up looking for housing assistance a long time ago. Uh, one day on a whim, she stopped by the housing authority and asked about the list. And she was told by the person behind the glass, like, the list is frozen, because on it were 3,500 families who had applied for rent assistance five years ago. And that's not, that's not bad. I mean, the waiting list for public housing in some of our big cities is not counted in years, it's counted in decades. So I have two young children uh, now, and if I applied for public housing today in this city, I would probably be a grandfather by the time my application came up for review. So if Arlene wanted public housing, this is what she'd have to do. She'd have to wait three or four years till the list unfroze, and then she'd have to wait another five or six years till her name made it to the top of the pile. And then she'd just have to pray that the person reviewing her application would ignore all the evictions she's collected while trying to make ends meet unassisted in the private market. When we think of the typical poor family today, we shouldn't think of them living in public housing or getting any kind of help from the government we should think of Arlene, because she's the average case. So on 13th Street, Arlene found this bucket of paint and rollers and brushes in the basement, and she gave the walls a fresh coat. But not long after moving in, her sister died, and uh, she pitched in some money for the funeral. She didn't have the money, but no one else did either, and she gave out a love. The next month, she missed an appointment with her welfare caseworker because the letter announcing the appointment was mailed to 19th Street or maybe Atkinson Avenue. And Arlene's caseworker typed something in the computer and Arlene's $628 a month check was cut. We call it getting sanctioned. And by that time, she fell two months behind in rent and she got the pink papers. So Milwaukee is a city of about 105,000 renter homes. Every year in Milwaukee, landlords evict uh, 16,000 people. That's about 40 people a day evicted in Milwaukee. Uh, we've now crunched the numbers in Cleveland and Kansas City and Chicago. We found rates similar to Milwaukee's. New York City sees 60 Marshall evictions every single day. It's estimated that renters in over 2.8 million homes think they'll be evicted soon. Now, the first time I crunched these numbers, I thought they were wrong because they were so high. They're wicked scary, as we say in Boston. 
Uh, but these numbers only count formal court-ordered evictions. And there are other ways, cheaper and quicker ways, for a landlord to get you out. So Joe Porzinski, he was a building manager in the inner city, and he said, you know, Matt, for every eviction that I do that goes to the court, there are like 10 that don't. So what Joe would do, he'd say like, look, Carlos, you know, uh, you're behind, man, and I just, I need my money. Um, I'll tell you what, I'll give you 200 bucks and I'll let you use my van if you're out by Sunday. So if you gotta get evicted, that's not a bad eviction. I met another landlord that if you're behind, he'll just take your door off. There are a lot of ways to get a family out, and we worked really hard in that survey to capture all those informal evictions that never go through the court. And if you add those up with formal evictions that are legally processed, and if you count things like building condemnations, like what happened to Arlene's place on 9th Street, 19th Street, and landlord foreclosures, you learn that every two years in Milwaukee, one in eight renters is evicted, which is crazy. One in eight, not one in eight single moms, not one in eight folks in deep poverty, just one in eight renters every, eight, every two years. And like poverty researchers and journalists like me, like for a long time we've written sentences like this, low-income families exhibit high rates of residential insecurity. <laughs> and, and we haven't said why. And I think that what we're learning is that poor folks are moving so much because they're forced to. And it's not just a rhetorical point. You know, we have a statistical model that shows that if you control for evictions, low-income families don't move more than anyone else. Which means, if we want more family stability and want more community stability, we need fewer evictions. This is a problem that affects the young and the old, the sick and the able-bodied, but the face of our eviction epidemic is just moms with kids. Uh, moms with kids. If you go into any urban housing corridor around the country, you just see like a ton of kids sitting there. Until recently, the South Bronx, its housing court had a daycare inside of it because there were so many kids coming through its doors. And low-income African-American women like Arlene and moms in particular are evicted at startlingly high rates. Among Milwaukee renters, one in five black women reports being evicted sometime in her life compared to one in 15 white women. And I think that should trouble us. I think that should disturb us because it means that eviction is something like the feminine equivalent to incarceration. You know, we know that many of our poor, young African-American men are being swept up by the long arm of the criminal justice system. They're being locked up. Many of our poor African-American women are being locked out and they're disproportionately bearing the brunt of the eviction crisis. This also isn't just a crisis that's on the north side of Milwaukee or the south side of Chicago. This is in poor white communities, which I write about a lot in my book. It's in Latino and immigrant communities. It's in expensive cities like this one, and it's in inexpensive cities like Milwaukee and Baltimore and Houston. One in five of all renters in America now spends over 50% of their income on housing. So Arlene went to eviction court, and uh, as is court custom in Milwaukee, she got to stay two extra days in her apartment for each of her two kids, and those days came and went and she was ordered to be out on a day in early January. Now my Milwaukee friends here will tell you, uh, January's cold in Milwaukee. And this January was especially cold. The weatherman had said it could drop below 40 with a wind chill. But if Arlene waited any longer, um, you know, the landlord would call the sheriff and he would arrive within 10 days with a judge's order and a sidearm and a team of movers. And they would have piled everything on the sidewalk and they take everything. like. The meat cuts in the freezer, the shower curtains, the Bibles, the silk plants, Jafaris' asthma machine. And so Arlene just struck out into the cold, and after a lot of calls, you know, she finally found a domestic violence shelter room 30 minutes away from Milwaukee. She just lied about being abused so she can get her boys uh, a roof. And she was once again on the hunt for another place to live. So she called on or applied to 20 apartments and then 40 and then 60, and then 80, I counted. Uh, she was accepted to none of them. Even in the inner city, uh, many were out of reach, and the place she could afford if she basically tossed everything she had at the rent weren't calling back either. And part of the reason, besides her poverty, was her eviction record. So in Milwaukee, your eviction is published publicly online for anyone to see. And if it's not in your city, uh, there are literally hundreds of tenant screening companies waiting to sell landlords this information. And this is a big deal to landlords. You know, most landlords that I spent time with said, we're not going to take anyone with an eviction within the last two or three years. So this mark, this blemish of eviction that follows families is the reason 
they're forced into worse housing and into worse neighborhoods after they're evicted. So finally, at the 90th landlord, Mr. 90, said yes. He had a one-bedroom one apartment. It was 525. Arlene didn't much consider like the conditions of the place, uh, what the neighborhood was like. A house is a house, she told Jory. So two months after their eviction court hearing, they moved in. And Arlene liked it. You know, all the lights worked, all the cabinets had fixtures. And when she and the boys had unloaded a bunch of the stuff, um, Arlene just like sat down on the floor and she found like a trash bag full of towels and leaned against it. And um, Jory came over and like pitched his 14 year old head into her shoulder. And Jafaris came and like snuggled into her lap. And uh, they just stayed like that for a long time. Um, so Arlene got her stuff out of storage. Uh, she hung pictures on the wall. She hung a sign over the sink to Jory that said, if you do not clean up after yourself, we are going to have problems. <laughs> um, do you guys remember what it's like to be 14? Sucky and brutal. Um, and it's especially hard to be 14 and experience long stretches of homelessness. Between seventh and eighth grades, Jory went to five different schools. And at his new school, he started acting out a little bit, and one day a teacher yelled at him, and he got mad, and he kicked her in the shin, and he ran home. And the teacher called the principal, but then she thought it would be appropriate to call the police. And when officers visited Arlene and her boys at the new apartment, and the landlord found out about that, uh, he told her she had to go. It's kids. You know, kids are a big part of the story. They can prolong the time you're homeless after your eviction, and they sometimes are the reason for your eviction. In fact, when we looked in that survey that we did in housing court, that survey where we were trying to understand why is it that you get evicted but you don't, even though you owe your landlord the same thing, what we found was it wasn't, it wasn't race, it wasn't gender, it wasn't even how much you owed. It was kids. If you live with children, the chance of you getting evicted tripled, all else equal. And what you're seeing in that finding is landlord discretion. You're seeing a landlord say, I'll work with you, but not with you. Because, you know, like, kids, like, use the curtains for superhero capes, and they flush toys down the toilet. They cause some guy whose car's just been smacked with a snowball to kick your door in. They can test positive for lead poisoning, draw the attention of Child Protective Services to the police. Kids cause us headache, is what one landlord told me. Family discrimination is illegal, but we know from studies that many of us don't even recognize that as a kind of discrimination. So after that eviction, um, Arlene started to unravel a little bit. Um, she told me, it's like I got a curse on me. It won't stop for nothing. Sometimes I feel my body trembling or shaking. I'm tired, but I can't sleep. I'm fixing to have a nervous breakdown. My body's trying to shut down. I recently published a study that showed that moms who get evicted experience higher rates of depression uh, two years later. It sticks with you. And we know that between 2005 and 2010, years where housing costs were soaring around our country, uh, something else was going up too, and those were suicides attributed to eviction. They doubled during that five-year time span. Arlene told me, just my soul is messed up. I wish my life were different. I wish that when I be an old lady, I can sit back and look at my kids and they be grown and they, you know, become something, something more than me. And we'll all be together and be laughing. We'll be remembering stuff like this and be laughing at it. The home is the center of life. It's our refuge from um, work, the pressures of school, menace of the streets. We say at home we're ourselves, everywhere else we're um, someone else. At home we um, remove our masks. In languages spoken all over the world, the word for home encompasses not just 
shelter but warmth and family, community, the womb, the ancient Egyptian hieroglyph for home, it was the same one for mother. So uh, eviction causes loss. Families lose uh, not only their homes, but often their schools, their community, your stuff. It takes a good amount of time and money to establish a home, and eviction can delete all that. And eviction comes with this blemish, which can cause you uh, not to move into a safe neighborhood, into decent housing. It can also prevent you from moving into public housing, because many of our public housing authorities, even though they don't have to, count eviction as a blemish or a strike against an application which means we're systematically denying housing help to families that need it most. So we push those families into slum housing and into bad neighborhoods. We have a study that shows that eviction causes job loss. I don't know if any of y'all in this room have been evicted, but if you have, you know why. It's such a consuming, stressful, drawn-out event. It can cause you to make mistakes at work, lose your footing in the labor market, and then there's the effect that eviction has on your soul, like Arlene would put it, your mental health. And I think when we add all that up, we have to conclude that evictions, which used to be rare in this country, which used to draw crowds, they're not just a condition of poverty, they're a cause of it too. They're making things worse and they're leaving a deep and jagged scar on the next generation, which means we can't fix poverty in America without fixing housing. So how do we fix it? So imagine if every family in this country had a decent, affordable place to live. If Arlene didn't have to give 80% of her income to rent, she could keep her kids fed and clothed and off the streets. We know from previous research that when families finally receive a housing voucher after years and years on the waiting list, when they finally receive this ticket that allows them to pay only 30% of their income on rent instead of 60 or 70, they do one consistent thing with their freed up income. They uh, take it to the grocery store they buy more food, and their kids become stronger and less anemic, and they work for the lucky minority of poor families that benefit from them today. But the vast majority of our poor families aren't so lucky, and their kids, with names like Jory and Jafaris, aren't getting enough to eat because the rent eats first. And like, if we can't afford the freedoms our country offers us without a roof over our head, like basic stuff, the freedom to better ourselves, to protect our children, to be part of a community, then shouldn't access to a decent, affordable home be part of what it means to be an American? Yeah. We've affirmed. <laughs> We've affirmed provision in old age and access to 12 years of education and basic nutrition to be rights in this country because we believe that human flourishing and vitality are impossible without those things. There is not an argument that says that you can go without housing and still flourish and be economically mobile. Housing should be a right in this country and the reason is simple. Without stable shelter, everything else falls apart. So then the question becomes, well, how do we deliver on that obligation? And there's a lot of good news here, actually. There's a lot of good news. I mean, just a few generations ago, there were slums in our cities, and babies were dying of tuberculosis, and there were outhouses in the middle of Philadelphia when some of y'all were still alive. We took on a battle with the slum, and we won. We won. And I'll be the first to admit, I think the book is pretty clear out about this fact, that we still have a long way to go. When I lived in the trailer park, I didn't have hot water for most of the time, and I told the landlord, like, uh, I am a writer. I'm going to write about you in your trailer park. So, so imagine what my neighbors had to endure. But there's no arguing that we haven't made huge steps in the right direction when it comes to the quality of housing folks are living in today. It's just an important thing to recognize because sometimes when you talk about poverty, the problem can be, feel so depressing and so entrenched. It can feel like we fought the war on poverty and nothing works. And that's just empirically false. When we want to take on big problems as a country, we've come up with big solutions. I also just take a lot of heart that there's organizations all around this country just putting in work, driving down eviction rates, preserving affordable housing, fighting family homelessness. So you, you can go to this website that we've started called Just Shelter, which amplifies that work. And you can click on DC or Baltimore or Virginia, wherever you call home, and you could figure out who's working on this problem in my own backyard. You can learn more about what it looks like in your own community. Maybe you can get plugged in with your time or your money. So what's the bigger picture? A problem as big as the affordable housing crisis calls for a big solution. We are bleeding 
out. And it would be disingenuous of me to stand here before you and say, my Band-Aid fix will do it, because it won't. We need real bold political leadership here. We need m real moral vision here. So one idea that would make a dream of affordable housing, a dream of a house for every American a reality, would be to take a program that we already have that works pretty darn well, the Affordable Housing Voucher Program, and expand it to everyone below the poverty line. So the idea is super simple. It's not even my idea. You take this program, and uh, if you fall below the poverty line, you qualify for it. And you get a voucher, and you can live anywhere you want, as long as your housing isn't too expensive or too shoddy. And instead of paying 60 or 70% of your income on housing, you pay 30. The voucher covers the rest. That would fundamentally change the face of poverty in America. That would make evictions rare again. That would drive down family homelessness. Families finally would receive that, that you feel when you're only paying 30% of your income on housing and be able to buy enough food and save. So there's two questions here that we might ask. One, would that be a disincentive to work? It's a fair question. We in the research community have spent a lot of time on that question. And there are some studies that show that when families receive housing assistance, they also experience a slight reduction in work hours. I think they want to just spend a little bit more time with their kids. There are way more studies that don't find any relationship between those two things. Nerds like me call it a null relationship. And I think the status quo is a much bigger threat to self-sufficiency and work than any affordable housing program could be. I mean, families are crushed by the high cost of housing. They can't afford community college classes or job training so they can get plugged in in a better place in the economy. A lot of them can't afford to stay in one place long enough to just hold down a job. And just think of all like the brain power and talent and creativity that we just squander because we ask someone like Arlene to spend so much of hers trying to figure out how she's gonna make rent from one month to the next or where she's gonna live after her kids and her inevitably, predictably evicted. Poverty reduces people born for better things. Arlene didn't want some small life. She didn't want to game the system and eke out an existence. In fact, when she was finally found stable housing, the first thing she did was start applying for jobs. She wanted to work and thrive and contribute in a stable, affordable home would give folks like Arlene a shot at realizing their full potential. So the second question is, uh, can we afford it? It sounds kind of expensive, a universal housing voucher program. It's totally expensive. We can totally afford it. <laughs> so Bipartisan Policy Center crunched the numbers a few years ago, and they found that the kind of program that I'm advocating for today would cost us an additional $22 billion a year, $22 billion. Raw number doesn't account for the savings we'd recoup by driving down homelessness, rates of depression, rates of asthma, things we already pay for because there's two ways to spend. We can spend smart or we spend stupid. That's just the raw number. Now, $22 billion is not a small figure, but it's well within our capacity. We have the money. We've just made decisions about how to spend it. So every year in this country, homeowner tax subsidies, especially the mortgage interest deduction, they far, far outpace direct housing assistance to the needy. We already have a universal housing program. It's an entitlement. It's just not for poor people. So the year that Arlene was evicted from 13th Street, we as a nation spent about $41 billion on direct housing assistance to the needy, things like public housing and Section 8. That same year, we spent about $171 billion on homeowner tax subsidies. That number, $171 billion, that was equivalent to the entire budgets of the Departments of Education, Veteran Affairs, Homeland Security, Justice and Agriculture uh, combined. It's a rather large number. Most of that benefit goes to families with six-figure incomes because if your income is bigger, your mortgage is bigger, so your deduction is too. Most white families in America own a home with a mortgage. Most Latino and African-American families do not. It is hard to think of a social policy that more unblushingly amplifies our racial and economic inequality than our current housing policy does. So, if we want to spend the bulk of our public dollars on the affluent, at least when it comes to housing, 
Let's just be honest about that. Let's just own up to that. Let's just be like, yes, this is the kind of country we want. This is our social contract. Instead of repeating this lie that the richest country on the planet can't afford to do more. If poverty persists... <laughs> you know, if poverty persists in America, it's not because we lack resources. We lack something else. Okay, so that's one idea. Like, let others come. You know, one city has to build, another has to destroy. Cities are different. You know, it works in D.C., it's going to fail in Milwaukee. L.A. needs a completely different thing than Birmingham does. But I think whatever our way out of this mess, one thing for me is certain, like, this uh, degree of inequality and this level of social suffering and this just like blunting of human potential, this cold denial of like a basic human need. I don't know, like this isn't us. Like this doesn't have to be us. By no American value is this situation justified. There's no ethical code, there's no holy teaching, there's no piece of scripture that could be summoned to defend what we've allowed our country to become. Thank you. We have time for questions. Uh, thanks, uh, sound guys, for getting through that uh, technical difficulty. And it's really great to see you guys up here. Thank you so much. Could you talk about how you established relationships that enabled you to be with the renters and with the landlords? Yeah, so uh, I think living in the community helped a lot. Um, I think, you know, Scott and Lorraine and other folks that I wrote about in the book were my neighbors in the trailer park. and. Uh, the landlords were really keen on just people understanding their work. You know, they, they were proud of their work. They often were like self-starters, you know, built a uh, kind of business up from nothing. And they were, they, they were interested in that. That doesn't mean it was easy all the time. And often, you know, tenants would not tell me things. So they were afraid I'd tell the landlord. Sometimes a landlord would do the same. But I think just spending enough time with folks and really living there uh, helped, helped do it, yeah. Uh, this is a, a great book, and I love the combination of quantitative and qualitative uh, materials that you brought together. But uh, I'd like to go back to your last comments here. Could you kind of recreate the historical context in which the original housing voucher program came about, and are those replicable uh, in the near future? And, and, and it's not a negative question, but just how did it come about, negative first of all? Question, negative questions are good, too, you know? Uh, negative questions are good. And, um, so, but I don't, I don't see it as a negative question. I, it's a really important point. So the story uh, of public policy toward housing is often a story riddled with like really big mistakes. So that's how it's read anyways. So, you know, we had a giant like social experiment called public housing, which was gonna replace our slum communities. And we said, why don't we build giant towers in the middle of really poor, desolate areas of our city? Prugit Igo in St. Louis, Robert Taylor Homes in Chicago. And so we built these towers up. And the thing that we often forget is like, that was amazing. Like when you read the, the transcripts of the first residents of those kind of public housing towers, they were like, this is incredible. This is like Christmas. But we defunded it. We gutted the funding. And soon, like, no one was picking up the trash and the elevators weren't working. And if you were a family that could move out, you did. And those towers descended into incredibly concentrated poverty and sometimes even, like, chaos. You know, Prugit Igo, these giant towers in St. Louis were destroyed 18 years after they were erected. So from those ashes, the public housing uh, voucher system started to emerge. And it has become the main way we provide uh, affordable housing to families today. It's not a perfect system, but there's no study in the world that shows that you can offer families uh, equal quality housing for a lesser cost than you can through a voucher program. So the problem that I always wrestled with when I was trying to conclude this book, like what policy do I want to get behind, is the problem of scale. There's all sorts of awesome ways we can address this problem, but if we want to address it at scale, the voucher program is the best way to do so. 
question. Um, you made a distinction between men who are incarcerated and women who lose their homes, and I just wanted to point out that the rate of female incarceration is rising exponentially in the U.S. right now. That aside, um, what could you tell me about the landlords that would surprise me, given my sense that these are, you know, bad people or something like what would, you know, something that would make me feel differently? I uh, I hope the book does uh, does its best to try to capture both sides with their full complexity, and I think it's way too easy, you know, just to say, oh, these landlords are just as greedy, or oh, these tenants are just lazy, depending on where we fall on the political spectrum. You know, from the sidewalk view, it's really hard. And so um, one thing that surprised me was when I started this work, I was like, why would you buy property on 13th Street in Keefe? And when I finished this work, I was like, oh, why wouldn't you do that? Because uh, you can make a, a lot of money, quite a bit of money. And so, um, you know, the landlord of the trailer park that I lived in, you know, he let me copy his rent rolls so I can account for vacancies and missed payments. I got his mortgage records. I got his water bill. I got his trash collecting records. I got his eviction costs. I'm telling you all this so you believe me that, you know, the landlord of, like, the worst trailer park in the fourth poor city of Milwaukee, which is 130 trailers big, takes home about $470,000 a year after expenses. That, for me, changed the way I think about poverty. Because it means like poverty isn't just about low incomes. It's also about extractive markets. You know, there are winners and losers. And there are losers because there are winners. And that point isn't just about landlords. I think that point is about a lot of us in, in the room today, including things like our housing and our schools and our tax records. Hey, Matt, thank you for this great, great book. Um, I, I want to ask you a quick question about the writing of the book. Um, why did you choose not to include yourself in the book, despite doing the same kind of immersive journalism as, a, say, a nickel and dimed or something like that. Did you give it thought? Did you think it would change the story? Or what, why aren't you a character in the book? I give it a ton of thought. You know, nickel and dimed is a first person because, like, that's the idea. Like, I went and I did this. And I, I, it, it is a form of immersive journalism or ethnography, but it's also, I didn't want the reader to look at me. I didn't want the reader to care about me. Like, I am not the important thing in the story. Arlene and Crystal and Vanetta and Scott and Lorraine, they're the important people in this story. And so I didn't want, when something was happening, you thinking, how's Matt dealing with this? Or where is Matt in the story? I didn't want you to care. And so I, I, I raced myself. And I write about like the trade-offs of that kind of approach in the end of the book. I'm being told by the bosses that I have to wrap it up. Thank you guys so Thank much you. for coming. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.